The Beginner's Guide is a story-driven video game written by Davy Reedon, a spiritual successor to the smash hit The Stanley Parable, a game that explores the relationship between writers, characters, and free will through a satire of choice-making in games. How can one game end so many times? It doesn't make sense. Oh, but back at the beginning of the demonstration, oh, that was lovely. Yes, that's what I want. A game of beginnings. Both The Stanley Parable and The Beginner's Guide are in a genre pejoratively called walking simulators, games that lack typical gameplay mechanics instead focusing on telling the player a story while they explore the environment. Walking simulators have prompted gamers to take up the rhetoric of the games are not art crowd by saying walking simulators aren't games. Personally, I think what feelings does the story evoke will always be a more interesting question than does it count as a game. If you prefer, you can call The Beginner's Guide a non-game interactive audiovisual narrative, and I won't try to convince you otherwise, but for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to call it a game. It's pretty much impossible to talk about The Beginner's Guide without spoilers abound, so if you intend to play it yourself but haven't yet, stop watching now. The premise of The Beginner's Guide is that Davy Reedon has compiled a series of short, experimental games created by a reclusive game designer named Coda. His goal is to look at Coda's design decisions and use them to gain insight about who Coda is as a person. Over the course of the game, The Beginner's Guide makes the case that this is a misguided and even harmful way of approaching art. By the end, it's revealed that Davy was obsessed with pushing Coda to make more games so that he could show them to other people without Coda's permission and feel good about himself by acting like a wise sage who explains the deeper meaning behind them. He even edited Coda's games, again without permission, so that they better support his theories. The Beginner's Guide can easily be interpreted as a metaphor for game journalism that's pro-artist, anti-critic. However, it also has a personal side. Now I know I've preambled a lot already, but I need to clarify something. It's sad that I need to spell it out, but I do. The Beginner's Guide is a work of fiction. D.V. Reedon did not literally pirate someone else's intellectual property, then sell it for money on the most popular video game distribution platform in the world, with narration added admitting that he does not own the rights to it, as well as recording of himself having a mental breakdown which he then programmed trigger events to play. For a million reasons, none of that happened in this universe. All the sub-games within the Beginner's Guide were designed by Davy Reedon. All voices in the game that are not Davy Reedon's voice are either someone he paid or a friend who volunteered. It wasn't a Davy Reedon solo project, there are other credits for things like visual art and programming, but none of those names are Coda. That's because Coda is a fictional character written by Davy Reedon. And Davy Reedon is also a fictional character written by Davy Reedon. He's a fictional character the same way Stephen Colbert is a fictional character. He shares a name and voice and appearance with a real person, but it's ultimately a separate entity, to the point that Viacom tried to sue the real Stephen Colbert for playing the character of Stephen Colbert on a different network. Personally, I think that's a great argument for copyright abolition and Viacom reps should be laughed out of the courtroom, but it still illustrates my point. Davy Reedon is not Davy Reedon. It can be confusing that the character is voiced by and named after the real person who wrote him. I figure Davy probably did it this way to goad critics into reading the character as a reflection of the real person, extending the message of the story into meta-text as critics make the same mistake the character does. In the interest of avoiding that mistake, and for general clarity, I'm going to refer to the character from here on as Game Davy. If at any point I need to refer to Davy Reedon, the living, breathing human in real life, I'll call him Real Davy. Game Davy is a guy who likes to be seen as insightful. He speaks carefully and with authority, while being kind of up his own ass with his personal interpretations, often overlooking details that cast doubt on them. Deep down, he's insecure. He admits in the final act that he's addicted to validation. He needs people to see his brilliant theories as justified, so he secretly edits the games to fit his ideas better. He's an unreliable narrator. By contrast, we know very little about Coda, mostly because we only learn about Coda through Game Davy, whose narration is unreliable, or alternatively, through Coda's games, which the Beginner's Guide itself argues would be epistemically flawed. 
I'm not ready to give up, though, to say the beginner's guide defies interpretation and that's that. Unless Game Davy is playing six-dimensional chess and made up Coda entirely, and I mean that's what real Davy did, Coda is a construct, there are some things we can gleam about what's likely true of Coda in this fictional universe. Not from Coda's games, but from Game Davy's relationship to them. I've avoided referring to Coda by pronouns because the Beginner's Guide makes Coda's pronouns ambiguous. Game Davy exclusively refers to Coda as he and him, but again, Game Davy is an unreliable narrator. As other video game pundits have pointed out before me, there are many hints within Coda's work that Game Davy's assumption might not be so clear cut. At the very least, the Beginner's Guide certainly plays with gender. Not including the Counter-Strike map, the first Coda game is Escape from Whisper, and it features a feminine-sounding voice, presumably Coda's. After all, who else would it be? Nonsense in nearly every direction features a high-pitched siren voice and the voice of a sex worker, typically a woman's job. The house game has the player doing cleaning chores that are often expected of wives and daughters. There's an explicitly female character in the theater game who the player character admires, and another female character model in the island game. Backward refers to someone with she-her pronouns, and the machine addresses the player as ma'am. Most people, even when they themselves are women, do not address hypothetical or unidentified people as she or ma'am. They either assume nothing and say they, or assume male and say he and sir. This would suggest that the pronouns and honorifics in Coda's games are probably referring to either a general sense of the female experience or to a specific woman, although specific doesn't necessarily mean the developer. The Tower is perhaps the most informative. While it doesn't refer to gender directly, Coda's messages to Game Davy portray their past relationship as putting Coda into a position women are usually the ones put in trying to gently talk down an overbearing nice guy who can't take a hint. As a trans woman, I've been on both sides of it. All these signs point to Coda being a woman, so I'm going to refer to her as such. And if I'm wrong, there's no real harm done, because, you know, she's fictional. The obvious counter-argument is why then, if Coda is a woman, would Game Davy not refer to her as such? Other game pundits have speculated that Game Davy only knew Coda online and just assumed a game designer was a man. This theory doesn't hold up because Game Davy says he met Coda at Game Jam, an event that takes place in person. So unless Game Davy is lying and never actually met Coda at Game Jam, he's seen her face and had at least one in-person conversation with her. And I don't think he's lying, because then he wouldn't feel the need to reframe the encounter in a way that's mildly self-deprecating while downplaying the actual creep factor. So right away I was like, I have to be friends with this person. In retrospect, I think I was probably a bit too pushy trying to get his attention. Uh, I was over-enthusiastic. But he was very gracious about it and very patient with me. And I cooled off eventually. Obviously, they had met online before that, but either Game Davy chose to omit that detail, or he doesn't count chatting online as meeting someone. There's also a line in the Tower game, When I am around you, I feel physically ill, which implies they've been together offline. And I'm really not going to buy the idea that this part was also edited by Game Davy. It also implies that he might have violated her trust in another way besides messing with her games, but we'll get to that. Now, I may be falling into the same fallacy Game Davy did by reading art as a reflection of the author. Just like Game Davy, I too am projecting my personal perspective onto the game, that of a trans woman who sees themselves reflected in the characters. It's my bias, I admit that, but unlike Game Davy, I'm not trying to push my interpretation as fact, as the only or the most valid interpretation. I'm also not asserting that my interpretation is in any way representative of real Davy. That said, this relationship between Game Davy and Coda feels like a trans narrative to me. Coda's games don't make it so, but they do provide secondary evidence. The question to ask is not do we have absolute proof. The question to ask is whether this interpretation provides a new perspective on the story that fits in with the existing text while adding more insight. Does the theory work in the scientific sense that it explains what we've observed? If we assume Coda is a trans woman, does the fact that Game Davy misgenders her make more sense story-wise or less than if Coda were a man and Game Davy were speaking correctly? I say more. 
I say it reinforces the rest of the game's themes and message and shines a new light on the character relationship. Coda being a woman explains all the uses of gender in her games as either referring to herself or to a general female experience, and her being trans explains the mismatch of pronouns. Either Coda was in the closet and never came out to Game Davy, or Game Davy knows Coda is a trans woman but thinks of trans women as being actually men. Game Davy is transphobic. Not overtly, he doesn't say trans people are gross or anything like that, but he casually assumes his perception of Coda as merely a feminine man is more important than how Coda sees herself. Sure, it's a bit odd to misgender the person you're reaching out to, but I say you should never underestimate a transphobe's ability to rationalize disrespect. After all, this is the same guy who shared someone's work without permission as an apology for sharing her work without permission. Game Davy's reckless disregard for Coda's boundaries doesn't stop at editing her games or sharing them without her permission. Coda's gender, an aspect of who Coda is as a person, is not important to Game Davy, and he assumes it's not important to her either, despite his claim that all he wants from this exercise is to learn more about Coda. If Game Davy was an anti hero before, he's now a full on villain. He only cares that Coda might be depressed because it would be the cause of her making games less often. He has thoroughly objectified Coda as a machine that makes games, which he then benefits from socially, emotionally, and even financially since in this fictional universe there is clear inspiration starting in Coda's games that later wound up in the Stanley Parable. In Coda's original design, the door stayed shut for a full hour before letting you go. The message of the game only becomes clear once you've been playing it for about four hours. So why don't you give it four hours of play to make sure it's effective? Alternatively, if Game Davy only ever knew a closeted Coda, then he's oblivious to all the gendered aspects of her games. His entire stated goal in dissecting these games is to better understand Coda, Yet he doesn't notice any of the hints the games give that Coda isn't even the gender he thought she was. That's because Game Davy isn't looking for a new perspective on life. He's looking for validation of the perspective he already has through someone else sharing his big ideas. So he never considers that Coda may have to navigate a world that treats her differently from himself, leading her to approach art in a different way. The experiences of being a woman and being trans are foreign to Game Davy. He can't absorb that knowledge by messing around with game code. So instead, he pretends that it's not a factor, that it doesn't even exist in the first place. He needs Coda to agree with him, and because of that, he needs to believe that Coda thinks the same way he does, and therefore, he needs to believe in a Coda who is as similar to himself as possible. Not only in thoughts, but in feelings too. Up to this point, I've explained why I think Coda and Game Davy really did see each other offline, but I haven't theorized what their relationship was like before they parted ways. The Beginner's Guide leaves us with some unanswered questions. How did Game Davy get his hands on the earlier games that Coda had supposedly moved on from before they met? How did he obtain the source code of Coda's games without her realizing he wanted to change them? He must have had physical access to her computer. The official trailer even lampshades this theory, and for a story so meta, I say that's fair game. Coda's house or apartment or wherever she lived, Game Davy's been there. This is, of course, even more speculative than the question of Coda's gender, but again, I'm not asserting this as the most true and accurate interpretation, just offering it as a lens to view the story with. With that in mind, there is no need to bury the lead here. I think Coda and Game Davy's relationship had a sexual component which in turn adds another dimension to the beginner's guide in how it plays with gender. I think Coda really was reclusive, save for one time trying out Game Jam. She didn't have much experience getting the kind of attention Game Davy gave her, and as a result, she just went along with it before she had a chance to think about what sort of boundaries that relationship needed. As for evidence in Coda's games, there's the likely symbolic title Porn Stars Die 2 for the series of prison games she made right after Game Jam. There's Game Davy's claim that Coda uncharacteristically invited him over to play the house game, whatever else they may have done afterward omitted. There's the Vulva Island. 
Once again, the tower is the most important piece of the puzzle, since it's a specific message addressed to Game Davy, and given that it paints Game Davy in a negative light, we can safely assume he didn't secretly edit the message. There's actually two things I want to highlight here. If you listen closely to the atmosphere track, you can make out what sounds like distorted sexual moans, and indeed, this component is labeled sex stem in the game files. I can't think of any reason Game Davy would secretly edit the tower to add that, which leads me to believe Coda put it there and ask why she did. Given that this game is a direct message to a specific person, it's probably there for a reason. Perhaps a suggestion for Game Davy to think about their past relationship. Perhaps a symbol of that part of their relationship being ruined along with the rest of it. Then there's the text comment, when I'm around you I feel physically ill, told you we'd get back to that, and I think, now with this context, it paints an even darker picture than on the surface. Coupled with the curled up crying at the end of the Floating Islands game, there's an implication that this relationship might not have been consistently consensual. This gives us an even more detailed picture of Game Davy a clumsy guy who casually violates various different kinds of boundaries without realizing he's doing it, either because he doesn't understand women or generally human relationships. To expand on this further, I need to address the pattern of three dots that appear in many of Coda's games. It might seem tangential to sex and gender, but bear with me. After playing through the beginner's guide several times, including once with the narration disabled, I think I figured out what makes the three dots significant. The dots represent